Welcome to the Three Old Goalies Podcast. A Delusion Group Podcast. The Three Old Goalies are brought to you by Scora, your digital soccer agent. Check them out at www.scoratech.com. Please give us a five-star review or like on your favorite podcast service. Music for the show is provided by the Floodgate Operators. Be sure to give them a listen on Apple Music or Spotify. As always, the Three Old Goalies is not for goalkeepers under the age of 17. And now we send you over to the Three Old Goalies and our guest Dean Linky. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for another episode of Three Old Goalies. My name is E.V. I'm joined by Greg Deutsch and Ryan, our producer, and our special guest tonight is Dean Linky, who has a plethora of stories to share with us, I am sure, because this guy has been around every level of soccer in the United... Well, basically every level of soccer in the world, so... uh, Dean, thank you for taking the time tonight to join us and share your stories with us. And uh, I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving, and I hope everybody's enjoying the the beginning of the Christmas season. And as always, a little disclaimer before we get going, 3-0 Goalies is uh, not for the faint of heart. It's it's probably a a podcast best listened to if you're over 17 uh, because – we're old goalies, and sometimes our language gets a little bit salty. So, uh, but without further ado, again, Dean, thank you for joining us. And uh, without further ado, uh, I will turn it over to the Mike Wallace of soccer, Greg Deutsch. By the way, we've got three Ohio guys on the show tonight, right? I mean, yep, three born and bred Ohio guys, oh. right? Okay, so I'm, I'm, yeah, and I'm, I'm kind of a. I'm kind of an honorary Ohio guy because the my my bride is from Ohio and I spent a lot of there time go. in Ohio. So go Elks. There, yeah. So, but go ahead, fellas. Go ahead. My bad. <laughs> well, Dean, thank you again for being on the show. It took EV what five months to finally get here, which yes. I am so excited. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the man is. The hardest working man in broadcasting, I quote you not. The premier voice of American soccer, Dean Linky. Thank you again Ex- of experience as a broadcaster, EB. Un- un- unbelievable, like you said. Un- unmatched. Unmatched. Un- unmatched. Um, you know, where where do we start? Obviously, we got to start somewhere. Um, but just to let some people know, um, Dean is a broadcaster he does also television play by play he's worked for the big 10 network the acc network fox fox sports and a, and a few others um just to give you the background of that ev right there right <laughs> those are some pretty powerful uh, stations you know some programs that obviously cater to soccer uh and to have dean do the justice that he does is incredible. Um, so, Dean, l- l- sort of let's start. You know, E.V. alluded to uh, um, born in Ohio. Um, you ended up going to Ohio University. Was that, you know, I still think now, Dean, it is noted for, you know, radio, TV, um, communications, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so what led you there? I mean, you played basketball, you played football, you played um um, baseball, baseball. Um, you wanted to be an NBA star, but that really wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so you went to the broadcasting booth. Uh, but tell us how you got there. Well, first of all, it's great to be with you guys. Um, it was great to see you and Hank Steinbrecher got inducted into United Soccer Coaches Hall of Fame. And Greg, it reminded me that you and I had met several times before. And then also, it was great to have you guys on the United Soccer coaches podcast it and it's going to sound like a sick fan but it was one of my favorite episodes because mine is very g rated or even whatever's lower than g and i let some of your bombs ride in that edition of the united soccer coaches podcast so uh, i appreciate that because you guys changed it up you made me laugh a ton and 
I've been looking forward to, to getting on. Um, yeah, to answer your question, um, yeah, I, you know, look, I wanted to be a great athlete. Um, wasn't, um, you know, decent, but um, I figured, you know, the best thing to do would be to talk about great athletes. And even in high school, where I was a decent player, you know, I'd lettered six times and a good contributor. When we would go to Cavs games or whatever, I would interview the guys when we were in the locker room. I would interview the guys. So I always kind of had the knack for being on the other end of the microphone, you know, not this end and talking to the guys. And they sometimes they pretend they're like world be free or, you know, Phil Mother Hubbard, you know, some of the old school Cavs players. And, you know, we'd have a good time. And and I was on the yearbook staff and, you know, pretty busy. I would do the readings for the school in the morning um, just because I had a little different voice than, than the other folks, I guess. And, you know, with, because of that, um, and one thing that I, I often forget when I'm telling the story, I would fall asleep. I thank my grandma for this. I would fall asleep listening to Ernie Harwell and, you know, look, nobody's Ernie Harwell and, and thanks for your kind compliments, but there's people that have done more in the soccer booth than me as well. So, um, and you guys know a lot of them, <laughs> but I appreciate the, the kind comments, but Ernie Harwell made me want to be a broadcaster as well. So I went to Ohio U with the intentions of being a broadcaster and on my own did it, what I call a hedge. I was like, look, I don't want to go to, with all due respect to Mobile, Alabama, you know, I don't want to go to a little tiny TV station for five minutes. So, you know, I hedged uh sophomore year in with a PR uh, degree as well. And lo and behold, I got an internship with the USOC and I got picked by two governing bodies canoe kayak and soccer and i'm like well at least soccer has a ball and it just happened to be the best time you could ever imagine entering soccer short of now i mean what we're seeing now like that was kind of the the pre-dawning 1989 if you look at the history books and we're starting to you know see it now bbc just did a, a great story on that 89 team and some of the fights they were having before the trinidad and tobago game and that's when i walked in the door in 89 and I haven't looked back. It, it changed my life and it still allowed me the pathway to what I always wanted to do, be a broadcaster. And we'll get to that a little bit later uh, on the podcast. But uh, that's that's why I went to OU. I, I did go for the broadcast part, Greg. You had it right. Um, and hedged a little bit with PR and PR got me into U.S. soccer, which got me back into the broadcast. Group. Yeah. Do you remember? um when you were interviewing with the federation who interviewed you yes yeah, um i do yeah i remember like it was yesterday um john polis um who you know i still have mad respect for um you know unfortunately i'm not as close to john as i am some uh, other people in u.s soccer like hank steinbrasher and like bill nutto i talked to bill nutto at least once a month but john um, was the pr guy for u.s soccer and he was the guy that was interviewing all the candidates for the internship. And he was really the guy that kind of taught me the ropes on, on how to be a PR guy. And then after that, I think, you know, you know, my dad taught me the value of being a hard worker. You know, I mean, I played all the sports. I did get good grades. I won the spelling bees, but I also had a paper out till I was 18. I mowed lawns, you know, I had to help my dad with his garden, which I hated more than anything. Um, oh man, I'm yeah, with you on that him. one. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that was the worst. Um, but uh, you, you know, I don't remember what your what was your question, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> That's about right. <laughs> Par for the course. <laughs> yes. Well, the question. Greg's not going to remember either. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Keep that <laughs> <brain flowing. Yeah. laughs> it was John Polis. So what was, you know, you mentioned Hank. So I talked to Hank about this. You know, I let him know that we were interviewing you on the podcast. And I said, Hank, did you interview him? He goes, yeah. And then he paused. I think I did. And then he says, I must have because I had to sign off on it. So what was your first meeting? Do you remember your first meeting with Hank and Bill? Yeah. Um. And actually, Hank, um, understandably, um, is just a little bit, you know, off there because there's there was so much that happened. Um, I was actually, believe it or not, pre-Hank. So started as an intern in 89, 
um, Kevin Payne was really my first boss. And, and I worked for the Walkers, Keith and Brenda Walker, who were from England. And I think actually I give them credit for all the effort I put into it. This is actually a good story in that they were from England. And, I, you know, you, you just heard the story. I was a basketball, baseball, and football player. My high school, I'm ashamed to say, still does not have soccer, right? So, uh, but, you know, I love sports and I love telling stories. And so right away I realized, you know, look, what? Why has no one ever heard of Tony Miola or, you know, Alexi Lawless or John Hartz or Tab Ramos? And, you know, it was really back in the day where the sports editors had their stodgy cigar and was like, you know, soccer, soccer sucks. You know, um, who cares about soccer? No, no one's ever going to care about soccer. And I didn't like that, um, even though that I didn't know much about soccer. I was going to change that. And so, I mean, I got stuck in. Even when I went back to school, like they wanted me to stay in Colorado Springs, but I would go back to school and then I would fly in periodically for international games, World Cup qualifiers. I would fly in for the Olympic festivals. I would work every summer until I graduated in Colorado Springs. Didn't even walk through commencement when I did finally graduate, which my mom and dad insisted I do. Um, so that entire time, I feel like Brenda and Keith Walker, because they were from England, they felt like everybody should love soccer. They were kind of my drive to say, you don't get it. Like, that's not that's not how it works here. You know, I mean, football, baseball, basketball is the king. We're going to have to do everything we can for people to love soccer. And I'd like to think if I leave anything behind at the end of the day, it'll be that. I mean, I had three pagers and I was accessible to every anybody. And if anybody wanted Tony Miola, they got Tony Miola. If anybody wanted Bora, they got Bora. If they wanted Roy regularly, they got Roy. In fact, to this day, the, to kind of wrap the story of how dedicated I was, the only place I found peace and rest was on an airplane. And to this day, um, and I appreciate you calling me the hardest working man, the one place that I can always find rest is on an airplane. Like, I love I love flying on airplanes because nobody can bother me. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but Hank, so anyway, yeah. Hank, Hank, I didn't, didn't meet Hank until after uh, Kevin Payne was there. And then Hank, you know, did kind of become my official boss, I would say. And then after Hank, uh, I didn't meet Bill till I got back from the Olympics. And Bill called me in and said, hey, how would you like to, you know, go live in Orange County, California? I'm like 24 years old, you know, <laughs> single. And like, and you got your own apartment. You don't have to share it with a roommate. I'm like, yeah, I'm all in. Yeah, get, so, get in. I'll drive. So, yeah, sign me up. And, yeah. and true story, I those two and a half years I was in California, I had no bills because there was another room. The other four guys, Renato, Rudy, um, uh, Fleming, and concept, the equipment guy, they had to share a room, so I didn't have one. So speaking of Cincinnati, my best friend who's from Milford, Ohio, biggest Bengals fan I know. In fact, he and I are going to the Jacksonville game. Uh, we're, we're a little bummed now that Joe Burrow's not there, yeah. um, and it's a rare time for me to have a little bit of fun. But he paid the utilities. U.S. Soccer paid my rent. I had a car. So I literally had no bills for two and a half years working for U.S. Soccer traveling the world. So it was pretty fun. That's a pretty good gig. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a pretty good gig. Yeah. Wow. You know, you started off as a um, for the 1991 uh, Women's World Cup team. What do you remember from, you know, everyone sort of got stories of the food, the hotel, things like that. What do you what what memories do you bring back and what stories do you bring back from that event? Well, more than the event, my first camp, I'm going to go back to the 89 thing, if you don't mind. And my first camp they sent me to was Santa Barbara. It was Anson Dorrance. And it was two years out from the World Cup. And he already had the team there, right? So, Dean, you're going out to Santa Barbara, California, and you're going to cover these games. We're going to do international friendlies at UCSB where Karen Jennings played, right? And so right away, my first exposure to soccer was well actually my first exposure was desmond armstrong he was in because he was injured i wrote a story on him um uh, my first exposure to them actually playing was the women's team in 89 and let me just tell you about this team so you got michelle Akers just smashing balls like just i mean hitting them harder than any man <laughs> i'd ever seen right just smashing them you got april heinrichs who's one of the most 
competitive people you're ever going to meet in your entire life, right? And you got Karen Jennings. And then behind her, you got Shannon Higgins, who's one of the most overlooked players. I think one of the all-time greats. And people don't talk about how great she is. Mia was already there as like just a 17, 18-year-old, right? Julie Foudy was already there. Lori Henry was already there. Carla Overbeck was already there. Um, Linda Hamilton was already there. Wendy Gebauer was already there. Brandy Chastain was already there. This was 89. And that's who I'm hanging out with, right? As a, you know, 21 year old kid in college or 20, you know, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was amazing. So that, I remember more about that than the actual world cup where we crushed everybody and Michelle Akers was brilliant. Um, the Karen Jennings was actually the MVP, by the way, of, of that, of that world cup, the first camp, that and then the first meeting with Anson where Anson got up in front of everybody and literally said to them, this is my first time ever meeting Anson. He's like, look, you guys are going to go out there and work so hard right now that your intestines are going to turn to diamonds. And they don't talk like that in Gibsonburg, Ohio or Fremont, Ohio. You know, they just don't, they don't talk like that. And he was so <laughs> majestic with his words. And I, I wanted to play, like I wanted to suit up for the women's team because Anson inspired me so much that, that's what I, that's the story I like telling the most, Greg. What a, what a, what a, what a wonderful story. Wow. So, you, you know, you were with them and then how do you become the senior press officer? Does, you know, you mentioned John Polis, who obviously had a very, very big impact on your life. Um, how does he get you into this role for the 1994 World Cup? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I like the fact that you pose it because it makes me remember. So I was bouncing from every team. So I was with the women's team. I was with the Olympic team as they were qualifying. I think I went to every Olympic qualifier where Steve Snow remains one of my favorite stories. When I do the Rotary Circuit. They asked me, you know, who is the, you know, the greatest goal scorers you were around. I say Michelle Akers on the women's side. I think she's the greatest women's player ever. Um, Michelle Akers, and you know, a lot of people think Mia Hamm, Carly Lloyd. I think Michelle Akers is the greatest ever. And then on the men's side, the greatest goal scorer I was ever around was Steve Snow. So I was bouncing with the that team, and then I would come in for the World Cup qualifiers, where you know John was pretty much running that. And basically after the 90 World Cup, where I was also working for U.S. Soccer. I was the American correspondent in Colorado Springs. So I, I was even working for him when Caligiuri scored the goal. I was out in Colorado Springs when Caligiuri scored that goal in Trinidad and Tobago. And then when they went to Italy, I was stationed back in Colorado Springs. You know, if editors did call, I would try to coordinate interviews with John Polis over in Italy. Um, so between those two teams, when the 92 Olympics came around, John made the decision that he had traveled enough and he didn't want to go. So I went, I was the youngest press officer there, you know, um, I wasn't even 23 years old and there was a lot of drama there too, by the way. Um, and, and since, you know, we, you said, this is our rate and we can tell any story we want. The only coach that I ever worked with that wasn't nice to me was Lothar Osiander. Um, I mean, he was the D word to me. Um, and I mean, he made it, he made it tough on me, man. Cause I'm a pleaser, you know, like I want people happy. I want people getting what they want. And he, man, he was mean to me. Um, and he and Colin Lindoris, you know, may he rest in peace. Both of them were, were mean to me, but luckily Ralph Perez was kind of around a little bit and everybody loves Ralph. Ralph made everything kind of nice and sweet, but anyway, John didn't go to the Olympics. So I became the senior press officer for the Olympic team. And then when I got back, um, you know, I did a pretty good job over there because we, we did the first game. Um, I feel weird saying that. I, I don't mean it that way, but we, we had the first game. The next day was the opening ceremonies. So every eyeball was on USA Italy, right? Because it was the first event. So everybody went, even if they hated soccer, they went. And he didn't play Steve Snow because Steve Snow um, was a little bit of a troublemaker and he had done something on the charter flight. I don't know exactly what he did, but and, and every media thing I did, you know, I was really original forecast for Barcelona snow, right? Cause the dude scored, look it up. He scored a goal, like in every Olympic qualifying game and almost every one of them was a game winner. And he looked like a beer league player, but he scored a goal in every single game. 
And who doesn't love that, right? Like in soccer, like, I mean, every single game, Lothar benches him. We lose 1-0 to Italy. That team, that 92 team, if you ask Alexi or Kobe or Joe Max Moore or Chris Henderson or any of those guys, they'll tell you that that's one of their biggest disappointments, that they did not get out of group play. And I think it's because he benched Steve Snow, who played the next game, scored a goal. We got a tie, but we didn't get enough points. I think we ended up with four points. We got a win and a tie, but still didn't get through because of that Italy game. Um, and then when I got back from Barcelona, that's when Bill Nuttall called me into off his office and said, hey, you know, what, what do you think of this deal? We're headed out to – so that's how I became the senior press officer. John sat out the Olympics, and I got to hang out with – you know, if you look at that Olympic team, the core of that Olympic team made up that 94 team, right? When you think about Alexi and Kobe right. and Ed Frito and Joe Max Moore, Mike Lapper, Mike Burns, a lot of those guys were on the 94 team. So that Olympic team lost that first game to Italy two to one, right? I thought um, it was zero. Was it two one? Two to one, I believe. I believe I could have it wrong, but I'm I'm trying to track it as we're talking. So I think they lost that one two to one, and then they beat Kuwait. Three to one, and then they tied Poland. Yeah, I thought we had four points. Yeah, yeah, it didn't, so, it didn't make it. And Poland won the silver. Yeah, in that Olympics. So, but Snow um, did not play in that first game. No, he was um, referred to as a cocky twerp in the post game press conference <laughs> when asked why he was not playing in the. It, and and here I am. I'm just a youngster. I'm literally <laughs> got to deal with all of this craziness, you know. And the reporters wanting to talk to Steve and Lothar unleashed and Steve unleashed and. Um, it was nuts. And then the next day, one kind of interesting thing is walking to opening ceremonies. I wasn't with the team. I was um, actually um, with some of the press. I actually walked into the opening ceremonies with OJ Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah, that is. Yeah. We have our first broadcast and our first mention of OJ Simpson. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> We're it may not large. happen again. <laughs> well, what's crazy about that, though, is after the World Cup, my wife, who the best thing that happened to me at the World Cup, and Hank's one of them, but the very best thing was I met my wife. She was the protocol manager, and we'll celebrate 29 years. Um, and she's my best friend, and she's my hero. I, I love her with all my heart. So that's definitely the best thing. But when the World Cup was over, um, you know, everybody got kind of big fat paychecks, right? That worked for the World Cup Organizing Committee. Those of us that worked for U.S. Soccer, we got whatever paycheck that Miola and Ramos <laughs> decided to give the, you know, the staff, you know, which was nowhere, nowhere near that. So my wife took a year off and her only job was to watch the OJ trial. I mean, from start to finish, she didn't miss a day. And we ended up, we lived in Westwood. We literally were a mile and a half from Brentwood. Um, so it's kind of a little bit of irony there, I think. Yeah, you know, jump into the story. How did you meet your wife? You know, you said, hey, at U.S. Soccer, but go into a little bit more details of what was she doing there and how did, you know, and if you're traveling that much, how do you actually get to, a chance to uh, encounter her? Yeah, that's a good, that's a great question, too, because um, she has a little bit different take than me, um, but I met her first at a press conference at the Rose Bowl. Um, and she said that I did not soak her in as much as she thought that I should have, but I definitely remembered. And then once a month, I would have to go up and visit with Alan Rothenberg and Sneil Galati. So we're in Orange County there in the Century City Towers, which ironically I would end up working in when the World Cup was over. And I loved it. Uh, I loved working in the Century City Towers. But I mean, two weeks later, I was in Century City Towers um, Sunil would let me use his office and my wife as the protocol manager was just down the hall. She spoke five languages. So, you know, Sunil, well-educated guy had, you know, a ton of respect for her. And I'm like, Hey, who's that? And he's like, that, that's Leah Pavao. You got no chance. <laughs> you, got, you got no chance. And I'm like, okay, all right. I hear you. Challenge and, accepted. Yeah, yeah challenge exactly. accepted. And I'll give Sunil credit. Sunil, along with Bill Nutto and Amber Steele and a few others, came to our wedding in Chapel Hill. And every New Year's Eve, I text Sunil the number and write, no chance. And he'll confirm this. <laughs> oh, that's every funny. Good for you. So, yeah. You. Sunil, Sunil said no way. And uh, 
I, I landed the the big fish, I think. You know, I definitely <laughs> I definitely hit out of my league. So <laughs> what a great story, huh? Oh my gosh. That is, that's great. <laughs> What do you remember? Uh, uh, obviously, you know, in the World Cup '94, the what? First, tell us where you were, what your expectation of that game. You know, give us a little foundation because obviously you were right there and you can share, you share some good insight. So, you, like, what game? The Switzerland game, the Colombia, the Colombia, the Colombia. Yeah. You know, the Colombia yeah. game. You know, well, obviously, there's a you know first. Were you with the turf in Detroit as a press officer? Were you reporting that because at that time that was a big thing, you know, playing indoors, bringing in the turf over the other grass? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that was part of it. Yeah, we, you know, we met with the media, um, you know, after the practice there, and they talked to the players on the turf, and you know, they talked more to the players than me about the turf and. Um, and, you know, the grass coming in for the turf and the players talked about it. Um, you know, I mean, one of the special things the night before the World Cup, we all went over to the Pontiac Silverdome and all of us held hands, the staff and all the players and walked the walked the field the night before. That's a moment that I'll never forget. And I get chills as I'm thinking about it. And, you know, the fact that we got out of there with a draw, um, I felt like we were you know pretty happy with with the result, um, the fact that it was in Detroit and I'm from Toledo, the Toledo Blade and the Fremont News Messenger were there to do a little story on me as this young little pipsqueak dude. Um, cool. You know, that was kind of cool, especially as a guy who delivered it cool. Blade for, for 12 years. Um, you know, that was awesome, but nothing, nothing will ever replace, you know, I got down on the field in time. Um, I didn't do an Aaron Heifetz and run out on the field, you know, with the vest on or anything, but I got down on the field in time to truly soak it in, to see Lalas understand the moment and put the flag around him, to see Tony Miola truly like soak it in and, and feel the fans and feel the teammates and know what it meant because they knew they were going through. I don't, you know, I don't know how they knew, but somehow they they knew. I mean, they were saying it to me, Dean, we're going through, you know, we're going through, which you know, we did. We lost the we lost the next game when Miola actually, you know, let in a, a disappointing goal by his standard because you guys are three old goalies, you know, he let in a near post goal. Um, but, you know, we still got in. Um, and there is a funny story related to that game on 4th of July that we, I can share with you a little bit later. But I remember all of it, Greg, and I'm glad that, you know, that was your main focus, the Columbia game. And I'm glad that I was smart enough because, um, you know, sometimes I'm not to know that, hey, you better go down there and soak this in. You better figure out a way to, you know, truly soak it in. Because if you remember, Columbia was picked to win the thing. You know, absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I was mean, gonna phenomenal. I mean, and they had. Yeah, all I was gonna ask you, yeah. Dean. Let me interrupt. I was gonna ask you. You know, going into the game, especially what you just said. Here we are playing Columbia. They're ranked. This is sort of a must-win game if you think about it, right? Yeah. Um, and then. You know, but share with us what you're – do we really have a chance or not? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, there was a lot of belief. Um, and, you know, Bora was an interesting character in that um, – he was a character, right? So you you never <laughs> totally knew – yeah, you never totally knew if you knew him, but you knew that if you worked hard that he loved you. You know what I mean? That he would protect you and – I always felt that with him. He made me feel part of the team, you know, even though I didn't really speak Spanish at all. I felt like I learned it a little bit with him. And and I remember the training the day before the boys were flying. Um, Harksy was really ramped up. Ramos was ramped up. Thomas Dooley was bringing a different kind of energy. Marcelo Balboa was a little bit louder than he normally is. Cause I know he's a commentator, but he wasn't that big loud guy. So, yeah, I mean, Greg, you're right. Like, we knew it was kind of a must win, but we also knew there was going to be 90,000 people there. It was a beautiful day. Um, this crazy jersey that, you know, I've got behind me was going to be worn. And you did kind of feel like something was special. And then, obviously, on the own goal, um, you're like, wow, we got this. You know, we, we got this now, you know. And 
Um, and then, you know, Ernie Stewart scored as well. And I mean, his celebration um, and Ernie Stewart's one of my favorite people of all time. Um, I got time for him all day. He was great to me after the World Cup, did something special for me. Thomas Dooley gave me his uniform, uh, which I still have. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, those two were – I mean, my, my favorite player um, ever is Tony Miola because as a press officer, um, he never said no to anything I asked of him and still to this day never says no. And it's kind of interesting that you, you, know, you guys are three old goalies because he's still my favorite – favorite player, goalie, whatever. I mean, Tony Miola, I've got time for all day, every day. But, um, yeah, you know, Greg, like, you just started to realize that this was going to be it, and I got my weight, I got myself down on the field, which wasn't standard protocol for me. I would normally, like, wait in the press room or escort people, but I got myself down there in the middle of it and then got back to business right away. Because, um, I, I mean, I, I definitely took – and I take every job I do seriously, so I had that mode. But this time I did, I did soak it in, and I'll treasure it forever. Yeah, I'm surprised to learn that, Dean. That I'm thinking you can be anywhere you want, right on the field, and you're most of the time not on the field. Yeah, no, I'm in the press box with the, you know, with the press. You know, I mean, obviously, I I became really tight with, you know, I traveled the world with. A lot of those people, some legends, you know, some that aren't with us anymore. Roscoe Nance, USA Today, you know, I mean, who covered yeah. forever, uh, you know, a great friend of mine, Ridge Mahoney, Mike, you know, Paul Kennedy, Julie Cart, Michelle Himmelberg, Scott French, um, Tom Timmerman, Phil Hirsch, who I think still might be covering the Olympics for Chicago papers. I mean, some, I mean, some icons, journalists uh, were covering soccer and still are like Tom Timmerman. Yeah. I think still covers soccer for St. Louis. Um, so, you know, it was my job to take care of them. And I took that job seriously. So I, I barely r rarely left their side. And I think they would tell you the same thing. So walk us through, you know, we lose the next game and then we get to face the powerhouse. Yeah. So again, what are your emotions leading up to this point? And I guess I got to ask, were you on the field for that game? Yeah. Um, you know, I was on the field a little bit. Um, I, I've got a couple good stories about the 4th of July game. Um, you know, one's really funny and a little bit embarrassing. You probably heard the story already, but you know, one of the things they did, and I think my wife played a role in it as well through protocol is the night before, you know, they, we played on the 4th of July. So the night before they arranged for the president to call and we were also embedded with ESPN. So Mora, um, Gosh, I wish I could remember her name. She's one of the legends. Um, they were embedded with us forever, leading up to the World Cup, through the World Cup. They had cameras rolling the entire time. And that we decided to get in this room at a you know pretty fancy hotel somewhere near Palo Alto. And um, it was my job when the president called to answer and put him on speaker so everybody could talk. And true story. So I pick up the phone and President Clinton said, um, hello, Dean. So just, just on the first Dean, you know, I almost dropped to my knees, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> it was the president, right? And it was Bill Clinton. And then he literally did say, um, after I said, all right, president, I'm going to put you on speaker. And he was funny. He was like, do you think you can handle that Dean? And again, he said my name. So twice he said my name and it shattered me. And just to speed up the story, when I went to put it on speaker, zzz, like I literally... I literally hung up on the president, but the best part of the story is they call back immediately. They call back immediately, and Tony Miola has my back. He steps up and says, "Sorry, Mr. President, that was John Harks playing a joke on you." Um, you know, so with you. which you know, I probably was about ready to cry if I'm being honest with you, right? Because I had totally jammed it, but. You know, Miola, being the sweetheart of a guy he is, you know, took all the pressure off. Throws of Harksy under the bus. That's the, the sweetheart. There's Harksy yeah, under the bus. With it. <laughs> That's story number one. Story number two is a little scarier. Um, yeah, I was on the field. I was soaking it all in. It was incredible, um, you know, to be a part of it. It was packed. They were tailgating and everything else. But if you remember that game, um, Tab Ramos got his head shattered. I mean – yeah, in case, in case player you, after yeah, after let me interrupt in the in the forty sixth minute, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. Against before Brazil. halftime. It was yeah. before halftime. Right. So, right. In case yeah, people so, forgot, we're playing against Brazil. So go ahead, Dean. Sorry. Yeah. So he, um, oh, I don't know if I just insulted you or <laughs> what happened there, but, um, but he, he, it was before halftime. So yeah. they bring Tab into the locker room and I did get down there and I went in and Bora, and I'll say this and, and Bora is going to have to admit to it. Bora, you know, cause Tab was, I mean, he's arguably one of the best players to ever play. Right. I mean, at one time you could easily say Tab Ramos is the greatest player to ever wear the USA uniform. You know, since then we've seen Landon and Clint and Claudio and some other players. Right. But at the time there was nobody better than Tab Ramos and Bora shakes him. Can you play? Can you play? And his eyes are like rolled the other way. They're bloodshot and they finally get him to the hospital. And you guys know the rest of the story. I mean, it, they broke his skull. The dude broke his skull yeah. and Bora was shaking him. He didn't make the sub. <laughs> like if you go back and look at it, he didn't make the sub like, cause he was hoping tab was going to be able to come back in and play. And of, right. of course he couldn't. Right. So, he sub Winalda in to start the second half. Right. Yeah. That was exactly. the Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it, fact, I'm, I'm a little mad. The part that I got wrong. I thought the Italy score was one zero. It was two one. Huh, Ryan, I, I can double check it, but I'm pretty sure. Okay. Um, well, nonetheless, the story was the you know the little twerp and and Lothar um, uh, on that part of it. So yeah, that was that was pretty amazing. Um, and the, the USA played their hearts out, right? I mean they they ended up the other two to, we two to one for we, sure. We lost that game a man up. You know that, right? Like like if there's ever going to be a chance to beat oh, yeah. Brazil, it was you know it was a man up, but uh, they got one by. You know, they got by – I remember he got by uh, Lalas and Balboa and then, you know, you know, perfect shot, nothing Miola could do to try to stop it, and, and you know, that was it. Yeah. Um, you know, so from then you get to work for Major League Soccer, um, and you were on the ground floor of that. Um, I got to ask – it would take off back when you were living through it. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, the early MLS days to where they are now, and like before you came on, Greg, Ryan was talking about the fact that Columbus is playing FC Cincinnati and being from Ohio and seeing the fandom for those two teams is, I mean, I'm so proud, right? Um, I yeah. hate I hate Columbus because I felt <laughs> like when they first came to the league, it kept Cincinnati from getting a team. Yeah. I was like, I was convinced as a kid from Cincinnati that we would never have an MLS team here because Columbus was so close. Yeah. So that's where my hatred for the crew came from, like from back in <laughs> when yeah. I was you know, in the 90s. Um, I'm so and it's out of Cincinnati for what they've done, you know, and um, it's interesting because I don't think John Harks gets enough credit for what he did to help kind of get Cincinnati ready for that next level. You know, um, I think I think he gets plenty of um, love on this podcast for it, especially for me, because I, you know, I I think that Harksy definitely doesn't get as big of a, a bump, but he was the name that legitimized the USL franchise right right off the jump. Yeah. So when they when they announced him as the head coach. Um, it gave legitimacy to the USL franchise prior to them obviously making the move to MLS. Well, and you guys responded. I mean, you went to those USL games. It didn't have to say MLS. I mean, they, you went to the games, which is, you know, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, it, dude, it was fascinating, Greg. And, and, you know, this has been fun for me because the way you guys pose questions really kind of allows me to reflect a little more. I mean, you got to remember, like, I literally was on the phone with Lamar Hunt as he was editing my press releases. Right. And he was doing it so gracefully. And then I would get a call from Jonathan Kraft basically saying, you know, you nitwit, like, don't you know, like it should be this way or that way. And, you know, different personality, both uber successful. Right. But I mean, totally different personalities. And then, you know, I learned to deal with, with all of them. I mean, the original owner of the galaxy was way out there Mark Rapport, you know, like a shrewd kind of businessman that was kind of out of his lane, but wanted to make something happen, I think, for his family. And they all were in different personalities. And I was kind of, you know, one of the few that had to deal with all of them, right, for all their press releases. I went to every one of their press conferences announcing their team name and their GM. 
I was in charge of the big press conference with Roger Twybo at the Palladium in New York City, where we orchestrated that whole thing. I was a part of all of that, and um, I loved every moment of it. And I, I knew then, you know, like when I was talking to Lamar Hunt or you know Robert Kraft, maybe not so much Jonathan, <laughs> but but you know definitely you know Robert Kraft treated me you know really really nice. I, I knew I was dealing with powerful powerful people that um, wanted to, you know, make this thing go. And let me tell you, man, those early days were tough, but it, it created the pathway. The last team in was Colorado. Phil Anschutz, uber successful. I got to spend a ton of time with that guy. Um, not a big talker, but shrewd, smart, everything else. He's like, hey, man, you know, well, he didn't do it. He actually had Bob Sanders in his right-hand man. He said, you know, look, you've done the Women's World Cup. You've done the Olympics. You've done the World Cup. Why don't you come and, and you know, help run the team? And, and you know, I wasn't ready for that. A, B, I knew I wanted to be the TV guy. So I'm like, look, I love Colorado. Um, I'll come. I'll be the assistant GM, handle your communications, <clears throat> your operations, but only if you let me call your games. And that's how I got in. My first that's game great. as a broadcaster was at Arrowhead Stadium, Kansas City, against the Colorado Rapids. The, wi- the partner, Wizards. It was Tom Stone, who I think is still one of the best analysts you're ever going to find. I don't know. Tom Stone's the coach at Texas Tech. Um, coach that the Atlanta beat for the WSA was a great coach, still is a great coach, and a great human being. Um, but that's how I got into broadcasting was uh, through the Colorado Rapids. It was hard for me to leave MLS because, you know, I love Sunil and Allen and Randy and – and everybody there, but um, I wanted to be a broadcaster, and, and that's how I got in. So I have a I have a question. Can I throw one in, Greg? I know you've got your list, but how <laughs> how close was MLS realistically to closing its doors before that resurgence in like two thousand and two? Do you think? I think pretty close. Yeah, yeah, I, close. I think pretty yeah. close. I don't know. You know, they were smart enough to keep me out of it. A, B, Ryan, I was now with the team, so I definitely was not as connected as I was when I was, you know, right outside Mark Abbott's office and right, right. outside Alan Rothenberg's office and Ivan Gazidis and Sunil Galati and Randy Bernstein where, you know, I could hear everything and, and soak it in. <laughs> now right. I'm in Colorado and I'm just trying to, you know, you know, hope that we get 5,000 people there. I mean, we, we had to bring in the monkey. <laughs> we brought in the monkeys to get a crowd. We brought in the YMCA, the village people, rather, to get a crowd. We brought in Los Tigres uh, del Norte, which is a famous Mexican band. If you if you look up, like those, and then the Fourth of July fireworks show. That's the only times we had a big crowd. That and one of my other favorite moments in my life was the Western Conference semifinals when we beat Dallas to go from essentially worst to almost first. We were the dead last worst team. In our first year, we were we were like the bad news bears. Then we hired Mooch Myernick. Um, and I, you know, I'd like to think that I had a little part in that because I knew Mooch really well and convinced the ownership we got we our GM got let go and we went from worst to almost first. We we lost to DC United at RFK 2-1 in the second year. Um, Ryan, I definitely don't have that one wrong. Um and, uh, <laughs> in, incredible yeah, crowd. Ryan. Well, I mean, you, you know, you know, I'm already looking. So, <laughs> yeah, no, that one I know. And, and our goal scorer was Adrian Paz, who played for the crew, by the way. Um, if uh, right. got any crew fans listening, uh, no, nope, they don't. No, <laughs> no. Nope. But anyway, Ryan, I mean, they they don't. Him. I think, I think pretty close. I mean, it was. I mean, if you remember, like Anschutz had to end up buying like two or three teams, and Lamar Hunt had to buy. Well, two yeah, teams. Well, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we talk a lot about we're we're big Open Cup fans here. We would really, you know, we really really have an appreciation for that tournament. There's a reason why Lamar Hunt's name is on that trophy. Um, the time I spent with him, I I value as much as anybody because he 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 just was so respectful to everybody he was around. Didn't matter if it was the secretary or Alan Rothenberg. He just carried himself in such a sweet, humble way. And I think he's one of a, just a few people inducted into three different sports hall of fames. Um, great, great man. You know, this is a good segue, Ryan, for the U.S. Open Cup. 
Dean, we'll put you on the spot. What do you think U.S. soccer should be doing to promote this? This needs to be the, and Ryan, and John, Boa, this needs to be blown up, right? This needs to be having these players play in it and not in just the semis. Now, you're going to say to me, these guys are making a lot of money and the reward is nothing. And that's the problem. It is. $300,000 for the winning team is peanuts. I totally agree with you. But if you make it $1 million, does that turn the needle? What's your opinion on that, Dean? Oh, I mean, well, yeah. If you increase the 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 money for winning the U.S. Open Cup, that changes the whole dynamics. I mean, we've seen that, you know, even, you know, with bat, you know, with the TST this year, which was incredible to be a part of that is that's definitely one of the highlights of my life to be able to call almost 20 games of the TST and, and hopefully I'll, hopefully I'll be a part of the next one coming through. Um, yeah. I think, you know, I think if you add money, it'll change the dial, but also, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny when they don't like the Carolina Railhawks, we beat the LA galaxy three years in a row and Bruce arena didn't even show up. So <laughs> the Railhawks would have milk cartons. They would dress as milk cartons with Bruce arena on the side of it, and then <laughs> beat it every year, even with Landon Donovan out there playing. So like, that was kind of the fun of it, you know, like, Hey, if they weren't going to take it serious, we are, this is going to be everything to us. And, and I think that's, that's one of the intriguing parts of it, Greg, but um, I get what you're saying. You want the best teams to go for it from the beginning and, and want to win it and then also get everybody behind it and the build up and everything else. Um, and because Lamar Hunt's name is on it, Ryan, to your credit, um, I think it'd be fantastic if they did a little bit more for it, but that's way above my, my pay grade short of what you're saying, Greg, you know, <laughs> offered a ton of money to try to hype it up. But even then, you know, I mean, that may not move the meter for some of those teams because they're already making a pretty good amount of money. Right. Yeah, exactly. I, I totally agree with that. <laughs> no question. Um, I, I want to ask, you were you nervous because you had never done anything like this before as far as being the television play by play when you did the Colorado Rapids? Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um in fact, you know, I uh when I was at Ohio U, I did have a radio show, but I never did call any of the games, which is interesting now because you know, I did the first ever game on the Big 10 network and now Big 10 Plus is all kids calling the games, right? And I definitely would have been but when i went to college they they weren't doing that they weren't they weren't letting kids call games on quote tv you know it's internet but everything is internet tv now anyway right even yeah you would kind of watch yeah well i'm constantly blasting people on twitter that are blowing those kids up during games because that like they don't realize that it's students that are doing a lot of the broadcasting on those games like the horizon league matches i tend to watch those since nku is involved in that league so i i see some of that um i probably watch more than i should but there are people online like how terrible are these broadcasters and i was like that kid's 18 years old like yeah. get, go give it a shot it's not easy no it's not yeah. <laughs> I, I listen to those kids i try to help those kids when i can when they reach out to me i always respond to i probably get one broadcaster every two weeks that reach out to me and want me to oh. watch, watch a reel and that type of thing and to be honest with you like I feel like my bandwidth is getting shorter and shorter to do it, but I feel like it's more and more of what I need to do, right? Because I feel like it's the the right thing to do. So I'm I'm kind of fighting with that, you know, bandwidth versus the right thing to do. And um, I, you know, I figure out a way to to go with the latter. But to go back to your question, I was beyond nervous, you know. Like, um, <laughs> I mean, think about this. I didn't even have a trial game, and they're talking to you, right? So they're talking to you as you're going on, they're talking to you as you're going off and you got to keep talking. And, um, I didn't have any training in that, no training, but I mean, I adjusted right away. Um, and I think it's one of, it's one of the things I'm most proud of as a broadcaster, they can say anything they want to me at any time. And it doesn't throw me off. You know, maybe they'll get a giggle out of me because they know I like to laugh for a little bit, you know, that I don't mind, but it doesn't throw me off as they're counting me down from 10 or if they're saying, Hey, we got to get a promo in or any, any kind of that stuff. I can still finish my thought on the play and, and keep on going. That's the biggest thing about being a play by play guy. You have no idea how much they talk to you during the game. 
Um, Cause there's a lot to do, right? There's a lot that have to get covered. And I've done it enough now where I know what I think people want to see. So I'm in talk back a lot asking for, Hey man, that touch that, um, you know, he just made at midfield was better than the goal. Like, can you wind it all the way back to that touch? And, you know, they'll do it. They'll do it for me. Um, and I think that's, you know, just from 26 years in the booth, um, you know, <laughs> earn me, uh, you know, the ability to, to maybe produce a little bit more. Um, if you do that early, like the producer and directors will basically say, hey, you know, by the way, I'm the director of this game, son. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Share with us, you know, the first time you did something for ESPN because, you know, then you made it, right? So what do you remember about your first gig for ESPN? Um, well, you, I mean, you know, the, the USL games were, you know, not on regular ESPN. My, my, my first real big gig with ESPN was doing the regionals for softball, um, which, you know, you didn't mention it, but, you know, one of the things that I did do several years ago was I crossed over into – every sport imaginable. Um, I even, you know, did the NBC bass fishing show, um, believe it or not. Like, um, so I've pretty much done every sport except ice hockey. You know, I've done water polo, you know, I mean, I guess I haven't done curling, but um, I mean, every Olympic sport plus football and basketball I've done. um, But I would say doing the regionals several years ago for ESPN out in Arizona where Mike Andrea, the, the, the head coach had won like eight world series. And um, I really got into softball and big 10 softball and got a call from ESPN out of the blue. And the toughest thing about that call was, I remember, you know, my wife telling me, um, you, you know, Hey, what, what do you think they're going to pay you? And and I'm like, God, I have no idea, but you know, I'd probably do it for free. She's like, yeah, but you know, when, when they ask you, you know, just kind of pause, you know? <laughs> so I'll be darned. Like she tells me, what she's going to pay me for the week weekend. And I never pause. I always like, yep, that's fine. I swear to God, I always do like, yeah, that works, <laughs> whatever, you know, like no problem. And because my wife told me to pause, I pause. And this woman, I'm not going to say her name. She is a power player at ESPN. And she's like, well, I don't know about you, but I ain't making that much this weekend. And I'm like, no, 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 that's fine. You know, we're, we're totally good. Like, I'm, I'm, by, the way, by the way, I did great, but she never hired me again. Oh, <laughs> oh what a great story, Dean. <laughs> I still give my wife shit for that, by the way. As, as you should. As Absolutely. you should. I, I never, I never pause. I'm always like in pause. That's fine. Let's go. You know, what else do you need? And she, she did not appreciate that pause. I can tell you that right now. That's great. Wow. <laughs> um, obviously you work, you know, the big 10 network for a long, long time. What was the, with uh, Jerry Yeagley, the legend from IU? Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously he, I had, I had met Jerry earlier um, when I was with U.S. Soccer, so we did an Olympic qualifying game at Bloomington um, against Canada. Won that game, and we went over to the Yagley's house. Now you got to remember when the Big Ten Network was launched, Jerry Yagley had already retired, so Mike Freitag was there. So, um, but yet, you know, Jerry was always around the team, and because I was at his house before USA played Canada, and he got up and gave another memorable speech that I'll never forget, where he talks about. You know, hey, I know that your 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 belly is going to be jiggling. There's going to be all these nerves, but you know you're going to do it together. And he does it in this just angelic, heavenly voice, and all eyes are on him. And he's the Godfather, right? Like, and so I've I've never stopped rolling with it. Um, you know, coincidentally, the Big Ten Network. You know, I did the first ever game for the Big Ten Network. So that's a lot of Godfathers. If you think about all the Indiana games, they now put a limit on how many times I can say the Godfather. <laughs> and I did the last game, and the game's over. Uh, Indiana won the Big Ten tournament, right? And here they are, another another amazing run. They're as we're doing this show, they're getting ready to to maybe make another College Cup, which is just gotta gotta beat Notre Dame. Notre Dame's gonna be a a big matchup. It's gonna be a big matchup. Um, I did the game. I said Godfather zero times. When I got off the air, I texted 
I said, um, in fact, I probably have the text. Um, I think you'll appreciate it. Um, I texted Jerry and Marilyn, who are truly two of the sweetest people I've ever met. Do you guys, do you guys, have you guys spent time with them at all? Um, yeah. I, I've, I've met Jerry, I've met Todd, but nothing like um, the encounters and experiences that you've had. So the game's over. Um, and uh, at five o'clock, shortly after five, I text him. Um, knowing because he doesn't he doesn't stay. He goes home and watches the games because he gets too nervous. Jerry, right? Even though the, the field's named after him and he lives one mile from it, he goes home and watches it. I said, Godfather and Mrs. Godfather, an honor to be back in Bloomington for another trophy. And even though no one got drunk today, because you know they have every time you say the Godfather, like people are drinking. The drinking, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because um, I say it so many times. I said, and even though no one got drunk today, and I put in quotes. I had to be all proper with, quote, Jerry Yagley, quote, you, in all caps, will always, always, always be the godfather. IU rules the day. And then they wrote me some nice notes, like, immediately after it. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, I didn't get to call the godfather, Greg, but getting to know him over the years, <clears throat> I, I don't do an Indiana game without calling him just to get a little bit of soundbite from him. And it's always one of my favorite parts of the job. Yeah, I'd love to get your 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 thoughts um, on uh, worth the wait. Obviously, I was very very touched, very because I knew a lot of the people. Right, um, I, I thought it was incredible um, how many people they got involved with it. The storytelling was fantastic. Um, what do you remember? about it i mean when you first were told hey we're gonna do this story were you like oh my god you're kidding me finally well i mean again greg that kind of predates me a little bit so like in in 82 i'm i'm a freshman in high school you know what i mean so like i i didn't know anything about indiana soccer or anything like that so <laughs> it was it was that was less about any you know obviously i became great friends with jerry yagley and john rennie as i call a lot of duke games and even for John Kerr Jr. now. So I loved watching it, but it wasn't like I knew the whole story. Now, when it's unveiled, you know, I love Don Rawson. He came to my wedding as I named yep. him here as well. And and I, I've i learned to love all those guys. I mean, they invited me back to MC their 50th anniversary just this last May. And, you know, I didn't go to Indiana, you know what I mean? So it just, it shows you how much they've let me into their family. And that is a special, special family. I mean, eight national championships, incredible. Um, but I was kind of like you, Greg, I was kind of learning while I was watching it because I didn't know that he started it as a non varsity club and had been trying for so long to win those championships or, or any of that. So, um, I, I'm like you, I was incredibly moved by it, but it wasn't like it took me back to a time because in 82, I was not thinking about Indiana soccer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. <clears throat> sort of how it comes around and this is a good segue for the international players now taking a lot of playing time you know back then when iu had some of their runs they were up against san francisco alabama a and m you know it was americans versus that those type of schools that had a lot of foreigners along with you know the clemson of course then you can bring App state into it um but now, and you've been doing a lot of the games, what's your take on this? And, and I want to sort of hear it from, a, you know, some different points. And, uh, and I'll tell you where I'm coming from in one point, Dean, is if I'm an American taxpayer and my coaches are going to get active in recruiting and, yes, they may win, but there's a bigger picture. You know, what are they doing for the community? What are they doing as – you know, to help the alumni base when they're done, what are they putting back into uh, the university? I, and I think in a lot of cases, the answer is zero. But we see that winning, and that takes over a lot. What, what are your thoughts on, you know, quote, unquote, this international player dominance? Yeah. Um, you look, there's a lot of them, right? Um, ironically, there's not that many at Indiana. 
Um, you know, they've, they've sprinkled in a few, you know, even on some of their national championship teams, they had the Ukrainians or Russians. I'm not quite, I can't remember where they were from when they had that, that good run where they won a couple of them as well. And some of the greatest players ever in Indiana's history, but for the most part, they don't have that many international players, you know, right now on the team, they have the Spaniard um, who played at Fairleigh Dickinson, Hugo Bacharach, who is like most of the international players I've met on teams that don't have a ton. Um, and it's opposite of what you think, Greg. They are, and I'm blown away by it. They are the best students on the team. They are involved in the student academy. And they are making the most of the opportunity to get an education. Um, and it blows my mind. Now, look, there's some teams that are out there that I don't call that um, – their average age might be 24 or 25. That might be a little different. But the ones that only have like two or three, um, I have found almost every single one of them to be like impeccable students. Even a team like NC State, who you know has struggled. If you go back a couple of years where they went to the NCAA tournament three years in a row, um, they had a few internationals, but not really. They mostly were junior college transfers um, and, you know, maybe, you know, Latino, um, New York City based type kids. But, you know, they still were Americanized long before they came over. But their goalkeeper was German and the, the dude graduated like summa cum laude. You know what I mean? Like he was an incredible student, incredible human being. And so I have a different perspective on the international players. And then when I got to talk to Hugo Bacharach before the final, um, first of all, the guy is like, I mean, he looks like Burt Reynolds, you know, like he's this tall Spaniard. And I, you know, I said, you know, why Indiana when you entered the transfer portal? And he's like, well, it's like, you know, the Real Madrid of college soccer. That's why when Real Madrid wanted me, that's where I wanted to go. And turns out he's a great student, you know? So that's been, that's my experience has been opposite Greg of what, what you may think. But again, I, I'm not called, um, you know, like Missouri State or, you know, who, you know, I, I wish them well, you know, I mean, they figured it out, you know what I mean? They, they've done their thing. And, uh, but I don't, I don't know that team. Like I know the teams that I call the teams that I call have one or two. I mean, look at the big 10. I mean, there's, there's just a few, right. I mean, but they're all pretty good. They're model citizens. I mean, Ohio state, Lawrence Wooten from England stud, right. Great human being. I already talked about Hugo Backrack for Indiana. Wisconsin's got um, a couple that are, you know, they got the Iceland left back who's who's incredible, probably the best left back in the league. But according to Neil Jones, a tremendous citizen, goes to class. Like, I actually think they have the right mentality about what it means, maybe sometimes even more than some of the younger Americans that have gone MLS Academy mm -hmm. the first one, one or two years and, you know, then go pro, which also works. Like Aiden Morris – who, you know, will feature in that the rivalry that you're talking about, you know, he just needed that one year at Indiana and boom, look at him now. He's one of the best players in the league. So it just it all depends on like kind of what your purpose is, Greg, um, as you use it. But the international students that I've been exposed to, they're they're making the most of it, not just on the soccer field. So um, sorry, I didn't add any uh, salt on that one for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Indiana, Indiana is such no. a different different program, though. Too, Greg, you have to remember they have three players from Bloomington on that roster. Yeah, with they, you know. Players. Okay, yeah, but <laughs> still, I mean, you you have you have to take into consideration that those guys decided to stay there. I mean, I don't know that I would want to play for for my dad. You know, you know, like even though he has that pedigree, and I. I understand that piece, but they, I mean, they bring in a lot of guys from Illinois, Ohio, like they're regional guys. There's some guys from North Carolina on the roster, obviously. Um, yeah, but um, Gumbale, the senior, he's from Walnut Hills here in oh, Cincinnati, yeah. you know, that, that kid is super smart. Like yeah. super smart. Great. Great. I mean, I'm telling you, man, those, all those Indiana kids are high character kids. Yeah, and, and Dean, you know, I, I do agree with you. You know, the games you're doing in the Big Ten, you don't see it so much in the Big Ten. But if you look at Sun Belt Conference, right, loaded, uh, ACC, not so much, but certainly going that pathway uh, yeah. with a lot. Um, and and most of those, you know, of the three, they probably account for eighty percent of the top forty. 
Yep, so, they do. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's changed the dynamic. I mean, I I get what you're saying. Like, I I'd, I'd hate to see an American kid lose an opportunity. Um, uh, you know, because of that. Um, I'm just saying that international kids that I've met have made the most of the opportunity, not just to play soccer, but to to you know to get a degree. Sure. Um, but I get what yeah. you're saying at the expense of an American, you know, that that's something we can go round and round about. Yeah. yeah. Um, some, some other questions I have here, you know, you've done, as you mentioned, a lot of different sports and championships. What top three in any order, if someone says, Hey, Dean, we're going to assign you to this boom, fill in the three blanks where you want to go. You like want right to, you know, you want to do whatever the World Cup, you know, final, U.S. Open, tennis, whatever the event is. What top three in any order would you yeah. want to do? Oh, yeah, if I had my own choice, um, first of all, I I love, I love my 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 niche or my niche, however you want to say that, um, and I've embraced it and um, I enjoy it, you know, because to me, every every game I do feels like the World Cup, but. Look, I'm a massive basketball fan. Um, I still drop in Chick Hearn lines on a soccer game. Um, so my, you know, my dream, you know, would be to, you know, be a play-by-play -play guy for an NBA team. Does anybody know that's my dream? No. Does anybody even have any idea that I want to do that? No. Um, because, you know, every year the phone rings and they give me my games and I got to go to work, you know, so I haven't really – taking the time, but that would be, that'd be number one. Um, NBA. I, I'm a, I am a massive NBA fan. My whole family is, I have an incredible Steph Curry story that, you know, this show's getting long, but I, you know, I'd love to share with you at some point. Cause um, go, uh, no, go right ahead. Right into yeah, it, Dean. All right, just, <laughs> so both my, both my boys were, were great basketball players um, better than me. And my favorite thing to do um, even more than calling games. And I think you guys know how much I love calling games. Like, I, I mean, I love it. I mean, I did, I did NC central against Duke women's basketball on Sunday. And that for me was the best game, right? Cause that was the game that I was in. Right. And I loved it. I was in the crow's nest, everything else, but watching my boys play basketball, particularly when they played together, there was nothing better. Cause my, both my boys were really good. My oldest boy was really good. He played on the same team as, Carla Overbeck's son, who lives like three miles down the road from me, it's how small the world is, and Eric Montross's son, and then oh, another right. kid named Oliver Lynch Daniels. If you look him up, he went to the NCAA tournament with Colgate the last three years. So they were really good. So I never missed a game. I would I would work my Big Ten Network schedule around those games. They had a game in Ohio. Um, my youngest son, who had to work harder, he's smaller. My my oldest son, six one, left handed, could dunk. Um, he went and saw Steph Curry when he was like nine or 10 light up Georgetown and Wisconsin and Raleigh became a Steph Curry fan when Steph was still the, you, you know, he still has the baby face, but he was truly the baby face. We found out that Golden State was playing at Cleveland and this was before LeBron had come back. So you can get a seat to a Cavs game like before LeBron ten, came back. Like, like ten, wherever ten you bucks. So <laughs> we, we, we got tickets and we put him behind the bench the crazy part about this story is before the game, Max, who's got like an angel living over him, he says, Mom, you know, if I wear my Steph Curry thing, um, I may not get one of the T-shirts that the cheerleaders throw. And if, as as God would want it, we're sitting over the other far corner, me, my wife, and my six-foot-one left-handed Adonis of a son, um, like leaps over five people and catches one of those damn T-shirts, <laughs> right? And Max sees that. But anyway, fast forward to the end of the game where Steph hit a shot in overtime to win. We can't find Max. Steph Curry calls Max down on the court, takes off his shoe, and gives him a shoe. Now, the story doesn't end there, though, because you got the shoe. Ryan, if you got the shoe, what do you got to have on the shoe? What do you have uh, to get? You've got to get the autograph. You've got to get the autograph. Got to get it. So the All-Star Game's in New Orleans. I kid you not, Max comes strutting in walk with the shoe um, little kid, cute as a button, kind of chubby. Steph calls him immediately over. I'm not making any of this up. Del Curry and Steph are doing a three-point drill. They immediately put Max in the middle of it. Max shoots, gets the shoe signed. I'm like, Leah, please tell me you got a picture of Steph signing the shoe. 
No, don't have the picture, but oh. I know the people at State <laughs> Farm. So she got down to the root zone of State Farm. They found the picture. So now we have the picture. Step side. So you in. have it authenticated, essentially. All of so it. Dell yeah. over, over his thing. And I um and people are probably bored by this now, so we probably gotta end this soon. But I I <laughs> always believe awesome. in in saying thank you. You know, I told you I'm a pleaser. So I wrote a letter to true story to the NBA. The Golden State Warriors, a couple of years later, out of nowhere, we get a call from the NBA. They say, hey, we're going to do a Disney fan experience. We've read your story about Steph Curry and how he changed your son's life and how he's so much more confident now and everything else. I kid you not, they fly Max and I out to Glendale, California. No engineers, way. In a room, Adam Silver walks in. All these people walk in. Max gets up in front of all these people. And by the way, Max starts his first day tomorrow at the Charlotte Hornets, by the way, which we're pretty oh. excited about. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's great. Um, yeah, so so all of this out of Steph Curry, and you think it ends there, but then they put him on a jet, fly him to San Fran where he goes to the Oklahoma City game, goes in the locker room, and then a year or two later, they used to have what's called the American Sports Network. You guys remember that? The American Sports Network? ASN at all? No? I don't think I don't so. That. <laughs> okay. Well, it lasted a few years. I got a call. They said, hey, Duke, uh, Davidson's playing Duquesne. Can you do play-by-play? -play? Yeah, I'll be there. And I find out the next day that um, the Golden State's in town, and they're going to name Section 30 after Steph after Curry. Steph they, wouldn't Curry. Give him, they wouldn't retire his jersey because he didn't have his degree yet. So right. I bring, you know, of course, we have the shoe all framed up. I bring it, put it in the production truck. The producer walks it out, sets it right at center court, and zooms in it for the opening of the show, Little Max with Steph Curry. And then I got to interview Steph Curry at halftime. Wow. You can't oh, make it up. So cool. Like, cannot make it up. Wow. That's one of my favorite stories. That's, a, that's <laughs> super cool. I mean, it just keeps going. I know. That's uh, that's really, really cool. Like, yeah, right. People are like, Where, do you have a Steph Curry statue out in front of your house? And we should. But. You you do. You have a shoe <laughs> with his autograph on it. That's enough. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned that uh, North Carolina Central Duke game from the other night. How hard is it to continue to go in like do play by play in a game that's like fifty two to sixteen at the half? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> That is a great question. It's it's not as hard as you think because, um, you know, I love the game and, and I love what I do. Um, and usually I have analysts that I enjoy and, and particularly over at Duke, I have an analyst that I enjoy. She was a longtime coach at William and Mary. She's got so much wisdom about the game. So I always find something to talk about, just like what you guys do are doing with me right here. Um, and, and I don't normally talk this much, so I appreciate you guys letting me, let me talk. And I apologize if I'm talking too much, but Not I, at all. I'm enjoying That's it a lot. But yeah. I mean, to answer your question, Ryan, I, I still had incredible time because I, I got to ask her the same question you just asked me, how do you keep your team up for a game like this? And she's like, you know, look, they always got to be learning. Like, you know, look, they're going to continue to press because they're working on the press. They're going to learn how to beat the press because, I mean, at some point, uh, Central had to press just to, you know, try to get a bucket of some sort, and they did. And so there were learning moments. They have to learn about, right. you know, one better pass. So um, it's not as hard as you think. When when you love what you do, it's it's not as hard as you think, no matter what the score is. Yeah, it was just the complete opposite of what Duke men's team had to deal with with Southern Indiana over the weekend because they are actually down at the half wow. of that game. Well, let's, back, so. let's back the story up, Dean. So. Robbie Church is a friend of mine in EVs and a friend of the show. And <clears throat> he has access to do tickets. And the easiest tickets are usually when the students aren't there, right? The podunk do, right? So Robbie's been kind enough in several years um, in the past to get um, people who just love Duke like Ryan. And so Ryan says, hey, I'm going to be in the area. Can you get me two tickets? They're playing Southern Indiana. I'm like, all right, I'll reach out. So I reach out, nothing, nothing. He's like, he's not going to do it, is he? I'm like, give it a time, give it time. So finally, Robbie responds back, okay, yeah, no problem. Buy tickets because I'm not going to be there. I'm going to be recruiting. I'm like, cool. So 
that's the foundation for this whole thing. So now take it over, Ryan, because you couldn't well, believe that you actually Sorry. No, yeah, no. Like I, I am a big fan of the ACC in general. I, I actually subscribed to the ACC network. Like that was one of the first things when we switched television providers. I was like, hey, how do I get the ACC network? And everybody's like, that's a really weird question. Now I do watch the Big Ten network as well. I do a lot, I, but I love to watch the ACC mainly because I think it's to me it's the best women's soccer soccer conference in the country. Um, and given that I have a 10 year old daughter that loves the game probably more than I do, it's, it's important for her to be able to see that. Um, so we, we tend to watch a lot of, a lot of ACC. So Duke is kind of caught on Duke and North Carolina both have caught on and my sister lives in Chapel Hill. So that helps as well. So her and her husband, both her and her husband, both are at, um, UNC. Okay. They both work there. So, um, it just kind of, you know. It's just one of those things the ACC and I like to have this love hate relationship because I, I love to hate them during basketball season because I'm a Xavier fan and they're in the big East. Um, yeah, but I, 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 I'm, I'm totally with you. Like I, I mean, I grew up in Ohio, so the big tens where my heart is, but um, my wife's family retired to Chapel Hill. And um, I, you know, I love calling, calling this place home. My, my son that I told you that story about the last two years, he just graduated from UNC, but the last two years, he was the captain of the practice squad for the UNC women's basketball team. And I got to call a ton of their games. And you talk about my worlds mixing together. I told you my favorite thing in, in my whole life is watching my kids play. Well, now I get to watch my kids play and see how it makes a difference in a game I'm calling the next day. Yeah, I mean, that was my, cool. that that's was super my cool. point for me. Yeah. yeah. What I'm curious, Dean, expand a little bit on that. You know, so you have a guy playing on the practice against the women who are nationally ranked. What's his experience like? I mean, does he think first going in like this is gonna be pretty easy? I can jump over him. I can certainly run by him. You know, give us you know what he would say to you about probably the same questions I just asked you. Yeah, no, I love I love that question. I will tell you what him being on that team made him an incredible basketball player. Um, he developed a handle that he never had during his high school days and his commitment to that team um, was unbreakable. Um, so he also knew that there were certain things, you know, he couldn't do, you know, he, you know, he, he couldn't be overly physical. Right. Um, because obviously, you know, clearly men are, are, are bigger than women and everything else. But he knew when the coach said, hey, this is what Georgia Amor's tendency, who's a star for Virginia Tech, um, this is what I want you to try to replicate so that Deja can mark you, whoever they had in mind for, for marking Georgia Amor, um, uh, was going to make a difference. So, man, I mean, Greg, the, the short answer is he became a great <laughs> basketball player by being on that practice squad. And his love for the game is even bigger. And it's not, you know, just men's basketball. It's men's basketball and, and women's basketball now. And I think his goal is, um, you know, he, he just took his LSATs. Um, he wants to get his law degree from either North Carolina or Indiana. And then um, Courtney Banghart has said, come on back and, and be a grad oh. assistant. So, oh. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, you, you, he has he has to. I, know. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's one of those like they have a big game coming up this week too. They play uh, South, Carolina. South Carolina on Thursday night. So yeah, yeah, I watch. I know all, we're totally watch, breaking all, away from soccer right now, but yeah, I watch all gonna... the games because I, one, I love calling their games. Um, and by the way, I'm I'm calling Toledo against Duke December twentieth, and I'm super amped up for that because I grew up right outside of Toledo. Um, so I always love when it comes all back together, you know? So Evie, by the way, your questions today have been amazing. Yeah. You know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of one of these guys who sits back and observes and, you know, I try not to interrupt people when they're, when they're on a roll. You know. And then, but and then after the, after the show, hey. Dean, we get a text. It's like, great job boys. Yeah. I get, <laughs> yeah, I, I have a saying that I've told every coach every young coach that i've ever come across and it is the hardest part about coaching is knowing when not to 
right? Is when okay. knowing when things are going well, leave it alone. All right. Right. Well, and and let yeah. it let them win. You, you know, you don't you don't you know you yeah. don't have to you don't have to be involved in you know that. And well, but the the amazing thing about tonight is, okay. And I'm not I'm just saying this now. Uh, I'm not wrapping anything up, but I mean you may need to go to bed. But uh, what what I take out of this whole thing is how interwoven everything is in the world of sport. Amen, brother. E even though it's giant, right? E I mean, you know, there's, I don't know how many, you know, uh, different TV stations that cover different things. You know, you got, like Greg was saying, you got ESPN, you got Fox, you got the NHL network, you got the MLS guys on Apple TV. You got, it's huge. But it's amazing to me how interwoven it is. Yeah. And if you, if you are, if you can remember to present yourself well and to present yourself as humble and with humility and grace, and you're interested in making it in the sports world, it helps tremendously. Okay. Oh, because you, you never know who's watching. And you never know who's watching who they know that might be able to help you. Amen. Amen. I, I, and AV, I actually, I wanted to integrate you. It's a tendency because uh, when I interviewed the three of you, you were incredible. You know what I mean? And, and you, you, you did, you weren't as quiet as you were now. So, um, I, and I mean that again, not in a non sycophantic way. You were awesome. All three of you had me, had me rolling the entire time. So, um, uh, I love what you said. I mean, sports does really, it is woven, woven in so many ways. And, um, you know, I, I think sports brings happiness, you know, in times when we, when we need it, you know, um, and, and it certainly brought me a ton of happiness and, uh, and the way you very eloquently talked about like, Hey, you never know who's watching or listening and that type of thing. I, I appreciate that part as well. Um, yeah, hopefully Tony Miola listens to this episode and, you know, yeah. he's willing to come on and talk well, is to it us. Interesting, since that's interesting. my favorite show on all of radio right now. Yeah. <laughs> I listen to Counterattack every day. Interesting story off of one of the stories that Dean was talking about. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, worth the wait, right? Bone, you were mentioning that. Okay. That 1982 final. <laughs> I know that, what you're going to say. This is funny. Yeah, yeah. That 1982 <laughs> final that Indiana won, okay, the following year, Ken Chartier from Duke, who I'd known since, well, we were the only two New Hampshire guys who played soccer that anybody, knew, I mean, that I'd ever come across was, was Ken Chartier. He calls me, he says, we need a goalkeeper coach because Patrick Johnson's demanding one. Do you want to come to Duke and coach goalkeepers? Right. And I did not pause. <laughs> I, I did not pause. It's good because yeah. apparently they don't ask you back have. if I you mean, do that. For what they paid, I maybe should have, but I did not pause. Right. Yeah. And and you know, again, it's just it's just it's weird how everything is is interwoven. And if you pay attention to it. You know, it's it the the stories the stories the, this whole thing was as you know, uh, Dean was predicated on telling stories at the coaches convention. You know, yeah. is because we all get together and we tell stories, and and a lot of them are the same stories that you hear every year and everything and all like that. But the great part of it is 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 if you pay attention to it, there's a common thread that runs through everything, and in and you 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 know if again. If you pay attention to it and you know how to present yourself and you you cherish that common thread, it it winds up for the most most of the time it winds up good. I love that. that that's really well said. Um, and I I take that as a compliment as you kind of just you know soaking this this show in. Um, and even the tie to Ken Chartier. I mean, he's there's a guy like I didn't know as well, but when he walked into a room, I'm like. Man, that dude knows how to dress, right? Yeah. Hair is perfect, yeah. like, yeah. right? Like, I mean, um, yeah. I mean, that guy was a sharp guy. He right? is and it's smart. I mean, yeah. and Sharch, Sharch is smart, and and uh, and if you you know if you get to know him, he's loads of fun. 
Yep. You know, but he's not one of these guys who lets everybody into his circle. But once no. you get in his circle, dude, you're never you're never not entertained. Yeah, well said. Well said. Sorry, Bone, go ahead. Do you, do you have, no, Evie, I was going to ask you, do you have any questions for Dean that maybe you thought of? Yes. Well, I, I mean, obviously a lot of questions, but I think the greatest, you know, the greatest, again, I, I said at the beginning, you know, there's, there's, there are, there have been, you know, we've all been around sports. All right. And we've all been to certain games and, you know, but, uh, Robbie, Robbie Church and I were at the 94 game in the Rose Bowl uh, against Columbia. And, uh, and, you know, and one thing, and one thing we didn't mention what? was, the one thing we didn't mention was the greatest goal that wasn't scored was about Marcelo. Bicycle. Yeah, his bicycle kick. And he missed it literally by about 12 inches. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, and the great thing about that was sitting up in the stands, you know, and you see these commercials like on the Heineken commercials and stuff on TV where everybody starts, you know, the everybody starts going, Oh, here it comes. And you you know they're watching football and 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 it's it's getting better, better and everybody starts screaming. That literally, I can remember that like I was there yesterday. You could see yeah. that play developing. You could see what was going to happen. And by the time he hit it, we were all out of our chairs. You know, and it was just it, it, that. I mean, the game itself was phenomenal, but that was that was something that I'll remember from that game for, you know, till I, I'll take it to my grave. You know, it yeah, was just I, a, it was unbelievable. Unbelievable. And, Mar and Marcelo was is is a Tony Miola type guy in that yes. he was always available for me and still is i still and you know he was with the rapids with me as well you know so i mean kind of a a double family and so yeah. was peter vermees who i'm really tight with because when we got peter vermees in that second year he won defender of the year which is a fascinating story right here's a guy who almost scored a goal against waters denga right in in yeah. 90 in italy um becoming defender of the year and i think is arguably <clears throat> the greatest american coaches that have ever you know created um yeah, good stuff, Evie. I yeah. love it. Yeah. All right. Now you brought up Peter Vermees. I have to ask a Vermees question. Um, so they started off really rough this season, but made this this playoff run. What Greg, you know it's right. Like they were bad at the beginning of the year. They stunk. Yeah. Um, there were some some arguments, um, some fans out there that felt like he he got slighted for coach of the year with the turnaround. Um, obviously, I have that that's bought my heart for Pat Noonan and the job he's done here because they went from worst to first in two years. Um, but how, what do you think about how Peter kind of turned their season around at Sporting Kansas City this year? Uh, I think it's incredible, right? Because, you know, sometimes you wonder, um, you definitely see it in the other sports, you know, like if your voice isn't being heard anymore. And, I mean, he's been there a long time, right? Like he is, he is that franchise, right? And he is part of – you know, I don't know if you guys know, but their facilities are are off the charts. Like, oh yeah, oh yeah, the best, ridiculous. Yeah, and he's such an endearing guy. Like, when somebody like me shows up, like he gives me the freaking red carpet tour of the place, right down to every ice bath, you know, and and where they sleep. And <laughs> I mean, it's 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 simply amazing. So I, I and I'll see him in Houston. I remember going to a game against the Dynamo, and I'm like Peter, and he's like, meet me at the hotel afterwards, right? And I hadn't seen him like in in five years, but yeah, to answer your question, amazing turnaround. But um, I would even say to Peter Vermees that Noonan deserved the uh, coach of the year, Ryan. So I'm with you on that. But, yeah, fascinating because he he clearly started pushing the right buttons, got the locker room back, right, which is, you know, a key It's hard to do sometimes, right? It's hard to do. It's hard to Very do. Very difficult back to do. And, and, and they responded. I'm glad that you you recognize that. Um, yeah, I think the you... reality the reality for me is they're only out of out of the playoffs now because of a no call on a, a handball against Houston. Sure. Like I I watched that replay over and over and over again. And I still don't know how it's not. Well, speaking of getting but, the room back and how difficult it is, ask Bill Belichick. <laughs> right? Wow. There's, it's not, there's, I mean, you know, it's not easy. You know, no. And, that 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 Turner. I mean, I'm not saying Pat didn't deserve it. Pat does, but you know, it, you know, it, you, you've been there a while. You know, you think you've lost the room, but you turn it around. That's big time. That's big time. Yeah, I mean, they they struggled at the beginning of the season, um, and to see them like squeak into the playoffs and then beat St. Louis City, um, which I'm always down for a St. Louis loss. 
Um, I love them almost as much as I love Columbus. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, that's that's just the cradle of soccer in the U.S. There, right? I, it doesn't matter. Okay. Their fans, their fans just are douchebags. Okay, just saying. Like, just saying. I, I call it how I see it. You know, yeah, I mean, I've, I've I've never been in a city where I've seen a beer bottle get thrown at a baby before, and that happened. Well, you haven't St. been to Louis, Philadelphia. So. Well. In, in Philadelphia, they plan. They teach the babies how to flip everybody off during the games, right? Like, they threw, so it's, the they <laughs> it's threw expected. Snowball. They booed Santa Claus. Come yeah, on, yeah. I mean, they have a they have a jail in their their yeah. uh, stadium, yeah. right? At Lincoln yeah. Financial Field in in yeah. Philly. But no, I thought I thought Vermees did a, a great job. I want to make sure that I brought that up because, you know, I, I I tend to ride certain coaches a little bit harder than others. And I, I think he does a pretty good job at sporting. So he one of my favorite to point that out game all time. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Well said. We just, we just got a whole bunch of new names, Ryan from Dean. Oh, I know he, he listed the, all he these people. The <laughs> He's just name drop, know, name drop, name me, drop. He, I know. Exactly. <laughs> he gave me Tony. I got him, but now I, we got Dean on. That's a good you might want to get a new phone, Dean. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden, Dean is going to blow your phone uh, up. You're going to get a text, Greg, and the text back is going to be new phone. Who dis? No, I won't. Greg, I complimented Greg today, even on the phone. I mean, Greg is, I admire Greg because he is about helping people, I, I think, and I'm sure you two are as well, but Greg likes to connect people in, in multiple facets yeah. and I have yeah. mad respect for that. Mad yeah. respect. Yeah. And Greg, you know, you, you and I talked about thank that earlier much. today. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Thank you so much, Dean. Stories were incredible. Oh my gosh. We could do this for another two hours. I know EV. We, we so, could, we could, but it back you know, to you. Yeah. Yeah. well, we have to get, I mean, obviously there's more stories and we have to get Dean back on. It's taken us a long time to do it. You know, I kind of, I kind of <laughs> joke that you need to get a new phone, but we, we are going to ask you to come back, you know, <laughs> mul multiple times. You know, so and I'm gonna do the same. I'm gonna have okay, you good. Good. back on mine, and okay. you probably should do it after, right after the convention, so you guys can talk about, you know, Greg, some of the stories. I don't know if you're uh, going EV or not this year, or are you going EV? I am planning to at this point. Yeah. Okay. All right, Lucky. Yeah, Ryan, are you gonna go or? I I'm not. Um, I would love to, but it's just not in the cards for me this year. Yeah, we got but. those. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, we'll, yeah. um, we'll plan on that. And um, thank you. Thank you so much for the time. And uh, it's always nice to kind of reflect on, you know, things that happen in your life along the way. And you guys were a great outlet for me and I, I enjoyed every second of it. So thank you very much. Well, thanks. Thank you for joining us. And, and uh, um, you know, we would be remiss if we didn't sort of collectively say, that, uh, you know, it's, again, it comes down to the people, you know, and sort of the core or sort of the, the foundation of our friendship of the four people here is, is Hank Steinbrecher and we love him. And, and hopefully, hopefully he's listening to this. Uh, I would be a little bit disappointed to, in him if he is. So <laughs> <laughs> he's got better things to do I with his time. To do. He's got better <laughs> things to do with this time. Right, exactly. you know? exactly. Hank, Hank Steinbrecher, I've said it before. I'll say it again. Um, he and Bill Nuttall, the two best bosses that I've ever had in my entire career, without without a doubt, no yeah, no great. questions asked, and, and great stories along the way with it. So, um, yeah, I'm glad that Hank has brought us together. And yeah. um, again, thank you so much, guys, and we'll see you in Anaheim. Okay, that sounds great. That sounds great, fellas. Have a if I don't talk to you before uh, Christmas, have a great Christmas. We'll see we you in Anaheim. We better and, talk before Christmas. Well, we, yeah, well I like it. If come you, on, if, you know. If, if, and I hate to put the pressure on Dean because I know Greg is going to call him as soon as we answer. <laughs> you know, but if we if we can get two, two or three of those names on before Christmas, that, uh, right, so. that would be awesome. Yeah, right. I'll help you any way I can. All the best, okay. guys. We appreciate Thanks, it. Thank you. Thank you for listening or watching the Three Old Goalies podcast. Be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast platform or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Can't get enough? Check us out at www.3oldgullies.com.